Okay, today we are going to study branching processes, which is something like this. It's best illustrated by an example. First, there is one individual, and this individual can produce a certain number of offsprings, and this number of offsprings is a random variable. So it pro let's say it produces uh, three offsprings. And then this uh, individual is eliminated from the population. Okay. So let's call this uh, generation zero, and the, the generation of these offsprings is generation one. Okay. And now each of these offsprings can produce offsprings. So with with the with the uh, same probability distribution as its parents. Okay. So let's say the first offspring can pr produce produces two offsprings. The second uh, individual can may produce one offspring, and the third can produce uh, one two offsprings and so on. So that makes the second generation. And the first generation individuals are eliminated from population. Now we consider the number of population at each generation and that will be a random variable. So in the first population, uh, zeroth population, generation population, that will be x0 which is usually set to 1 as an initial condition. And the population size of the first generation is x2, x1. In this particular example, it will be 3. And the number of individuals in the second generation is x2. In this particular example, there are 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 individuals, and so on. So this process goes on. And sometimes, uh, individual may not produce any offsprings at all. So if sufficiently many uh, individuals do not uh, produce any offsprings, then the population size may decrease and eventually it can, it can go extinct. So this is uh, the branching process because uh, as you can see, they are you know, they're repeat branching. So it makes a kind of trees tree it's like like structure and this is similar to the uh, birth and death process but unlike the birth process uh, each individual uh, can produce offsprings at a certain you know in a discrete uh, time steps not in the birth process individuals can produce offsprings at any time, right? But uh, it's different here. So so generations are discrete. So first generation, second generation, and third generation, and so on. Now let's consider the problem of generational growth. So that means how uh, the population size uh, grows. So first we make some assumptions and each individual produces a certain number of offsprings and this is a stochastic phenomenon but uh, we assume that this the probability distribution of the number of offsprings is known so every individual uh, produces offsprings so let's say uh, j offsprings so j can be either 0 1 2 and so on. It's a non negative integers. So J offsprings is pr reproduced, are produced with probability PJ. Okay, so we assume this is known. So J is from 0, 1, 2, and so on. So the probability generating function uh, is defined to be G of S and j from 0 to infinity, and pj, and s to the power of j. 
and we assume x0 is 1. So we start from a single individual. Okay. Then in this uh, figure, the generation 1 has uh, four individuals, so there are four offsprings, so which was produced with probability P4. And then each individual in the first generation produce, pro may or may not produce some offs offsprings. So in this example, the first, this individual, uh, let's see, this individual produces one, two, three, four in offsprings. And the second produces only one offsprings, offspring, and the third one does not produce anything, and the fourth one produces two offsprings, and so on. So, uh, the number of individuals in the second generation uh, can be expressed as this. So, so we have uh, x one number of individuals in the first generation and the second generation in the second generation we can express this number as this y1 is the number of offsprings produced from the first individual in the first generation plus y2 which is the number of offsprings uh, produced from the produced by the second individual in the first generation and so on so we add this uh, random variable up to y x1. So x1 is the number of individuals in the first generation. So this, uh, the very uh, number of terms in this expression is a random variable, that is x1. So given this, uh, for example, in the previous figure, uh, let's see, this one, if you look at the second generation, y1 would be 4, and y2 would be 1, and y3 would be 0, and y4 would be 2. So the sum of these will be the uh, number of individuals in the second generation. That's 4 plus 1 plus 2, that is 7. Now we have the following probabilities. Uh, first of all, probability that y k is equal to j is given by p j, because y k is the number of of offsprings produced by a single individual. So that uh, probability distribution is known. That is p j and probability that the number of individuals in the first generation is equal to m is given by this conditional probability so that is x1 is equal to m given that x0 is equal to 1 which is again since x0 is only one individual it's, it's just one so it is same as pm so this is the probability generation of the number of offsprings produced by a single individual. So it's it's the same PN, PM. You know, this, this one is PJ and they, they come from the same distribution. And of course we also assume that we start from a single individual in generation zero. So X zero equal to one is this probability is one. Okay, so we know this information. And let's uh, define this quantity Hn, that is the probability that the number of individuals in the second generation is n. Okay, so this is the definition, and we want to find this probability uh, distribution. So this is equal to by using the partition theorem. Uh, let's say R is zero infinity. Uh, so this R is 
uh, the number of individual in the first generation okay, x2 equal to n given x1 is r times probability of x1 being equal to r so this is a application of the partition theorem theorem and as we have seen uh, this part is this so that is uh, p r, uh, r uh, lowercase p r and probability that x n equal to n uh, x2 equal to n given x1 is r okay so let's uh, calculate the uh, probability generating function of this so multiply both sides by s to the power of n and sum over over n so that probability generating function we call g2 so that is defined by this and from 0 to infinity hn to times s to the power of n that is equal to uh, let's see r from 0 to infinity pr and sum uh, n from 0 to infinity and this probability x2 equal to n given x1 is r times s to the power of n so far this is just based on the definition so how do we calculate uh, this part okay so uh, let's see this uh, part is uh, actually a uh, conditional uh, expectation value of s to the power of n, right? So let's see. So this is probability x n x two equal to n given x one is equal to r s to the power of n. Okay, this is the expectation value of s to the power of x2 given that x1 is equal to r. Okay, but uh, when, when the number of individuals in the first generation is r, then uh, we know that x2 can be expressed as y1 plus y2 plus and so on up to yr. Right, so we apply this. Uh, so we replace x two by this summation of y's. Okay, so this expectation becomes s to the power of y one plus y two plus up to y r. So this given condition is. Uh, actually incorporated in the number of terms in this uh, sum so now this is uh, not a conditional expectation and since this is exponential we can uh, split th this exponential into the products product of uh, powers of s s to the power of y r and now uh, each individual in the first generation produces offsprings independently of each other right so so the expectation value of a product can be expressed as the product of expectation value so this is equal to exponential of s to the power of y1 times expectation value of s to the power of y2 times and so on and y r 
but this y1, y2, up to yr, they are independent and identically distributed. So, and also, you know, this, each of these yi's is the number of offsprings produced by a single individual. So we know that probability distribution. And this expectation value here, each of these, these is nothing but the probability generating function we defined for the first generation. So this is equal to g of s, g of s, and g of s. So all of them have the same functional form, so r times. So that is uh, g of s to the power of r. So that is uh, uh, this part, uh, this part. Okay. So now, uh, after all, the probability generating function of of x two is given by this. So summation r from zero to infinity p r and g of s to the power of r. Okay, but now look at this. If you replace uh, this term by simple s, then it will be the probability generating function of, uh, of x1, right? So that means this is actually the composition of G with itself. Right? If you apply the definition of this G, which was uh, G of S, by the way, was uh, PR S to the power of R, right? R from 0 to infinity. And this S is replaced with G of S. Then we have this function. So G2 is actually the functional composition of G with itself. And if you continue this argument, uh, oh, uh, before that, we also know G of 1 is 1. So G of G of 1 is equal to G of 1, which is equal to 1. Right? Uh, by the way, this comes from the normalization condition for the probability mass function. So anyway, so if we continue this argument, then we can see that G3, that is the probability generating function for the number of individuals in the third generation, is given by G of G of G of S. So that's this and this. And this can continue forever. And uh, in general, the uh, the generating function for the for the number of individuals in the mth generation is given by this g of g of g of, and so on, and g of s, and something like this. So this is. Uh, composition of uh, G with itself and that composition uh, uh, is applied m times so this is uh, the general form of the probability generating function for the number of individuals in, in any generation now that we have the probability generating function, we should be able to calculate the mean and variance of the population size of any generation. In general, we have uh, this formula for calculating the mean and variance using, using the uh, probability generating function. So the mean is given by the first derivative and s 
is substituted with 1. And the variance, so variance is given by using the second derivative uh, and the mean. So these are just the general formula involving the generating function. So first, uh, recall that G1, uh, wait a minute, G1 is just G by definition. Okay, then let's try to find uh, mu2, that is the, the mean population size of the second generation. So that should be given by uh, this derivative uh, g2 and evaluated at 1. Okay, but uh, g2 was the functional composition of g with itself. Okay, and so by using the uh, chain rule, we have uh, g prime. 1 and g prime uh, 1. So that is mu 1 uh, squared. Okay. Of course, g prime of 1 is mu 1. Right? So that's the mean of the population size of the first generation. And this is of course, readily really calculated for, because we know the probability generate uh, probability mass function for this. So, just apply the definition, and we know the value of mu one. So, mu two is nothing but mu one squared. Okay, in general, mu n is given by this. So it's the derivative of gn uh, s evaluated at 1. But gn is g of gn minus 1. Uh, OK, so applying the chain rule, we have uh, g prime. 1 times gn minus 1 prime of 1. Okay, so that will be uh, mu 1 times mu n minus 1 because the value of gn minus 1 prime here will give us this mean value. Okay, so we have this recursive equation. To summarize, we have mu n is equal to mu 1 times mu n minus 1. So if we continue this, then mu 1, mu n minus 1 would be mu 1 times mu n minus 2, and so on. So if we continue this, it, it turns out that mu n is equal to mu 1 to the power of n. Uh, very easy. Next, we want to find the variance. For that, we need to uh, calculate the second derivative of the generating function. So let's see. The first derivative is by the chain rule. That will be g prime of g n minus 1 of s times uh, g n minus 1 prime. And the second derivative would be, uh, let's see, so that would be g double prime g n minus 1 of s times g n minus 1 prime squared and plus g prime g n minus 1 s uh, g n minus 1 double prime of s. Then we put s equal to 1 
and remember uh, gn minus 1 of 1 is 1 okay so gn double prime of 1 is g double prime 1 and and gn minus 1 prime of 1 plus uh, g prime of 1 and g double prime n minus 1 of 1 okay so let's see and okay and this one g prime uh, g n minus 1 prime this is equal to uh, mu uh, wait a minute this should be equal to mu n minus 1 and this should be equal to let's see mu 1 and this part g double prime 1 uh, from the previous formula uh, wait a minute where is it uh, from this one uh, this one so when n is 1 uh, we have uh, g double prime 1 is equal to sigma squared si sigma 1 squared minus mu 1 plus mu 1 squared so we replace this into here uh, we should have uh, let's see uh, sigma 1 squared minus mu 1 plus mu 1 squared and we've seen before this one mu n minus 1 is equal to mu to the mu 1 to the power of n minus 1 Uh, wait a minute so this should be squared here so this one times mu 1 to the power of 2n minus 2 plus mu 1 so this is mu 1 and g n minus 1 double prime 1 okay so these values are all known and what's unknown are this and this here so if we put uh, let's see uh, un equals to gn double prime of 1 then we have a recursive equation uh, that is let's see so we move this one to the left un minus mu 1 u n minus 1 equal to uh, uh, this part so that's sigma 1 squared minus mu 1 plus mu 1 squared times mu 1 to the power of 2 n minus 2 so this is a first order inhomogeneous because of this term on the right hand side in homogeneous difference equation and to solve a non inhomogeneous difference equation we first solve its co co corresponding uh, homogeneous case so that would be un minus mu 1 un minus 1 equal to 0 so to solve this uh, we have to distinguish two cases okay case 1 when mu 1 is not equal to 1 okay in this case uh, the general solution for this uh, homogeneous difference equation would be this un equals to uh, some constant times mu 1 to the power of n okay it's very easy to see that this is indeed a solution to this difference equation Okay, and now uh, to solve this inhomogeneous case, uh, let's see. 
uh, we have n here. So let's try uh, some. You know, we need to find some special solution. So that would be let's say. Uh, okay, so this is homogeneous. And for the inhomogeneous case, let's see. It's constant times mu 1 to the power of 2m. So how does it work out? Uh, so if we substitute this into uh, this equation, let's see, we have uh, c uh, mu 1 to the power of 2n minus mu 1 c mu 1 to the power of 2n minus uh, 2 equals to Sigma 1, mu 1, mu 1 squared, uh, mu 1, 2n minus 2. So this would be satisfied if let's see. So C Uh, mu 1 to n minus 1 mu uh, 1 minus 1 and equals to this so c is equal to sigma 1 squared mu 1 mu 1 squared and these will cancel except for uh, one over mu. So that will be what? Uh, mu 1, mu 1 minus 1. So if uh, the value of c is this, then we have a speci special solution. That is un is equal to this c. squared mu1, mu1 minus 1 and wait a minute, what was it? Uh, mu1 to the power of 2n so this is the sp a special solution so by combining with the solution for the homogeneous case we have, uh, let's see uh, plus some constant times uh, mu 1 to the power of n okay and uh, this constant B can be determined from a the from the initial condition uh, that is the case for n equal to 1 so in this case uh, let's see uh, u1 uh, should be equal to uh, this now this comes from the uh, the original definition of the uh, second derivative of the generating function for the uh, for n equal to 1 so this and by comparing this with this when n is equal to 1 then we should have uh, b should be equal to let's see uh, this one so uh, after combining uh, putting this B into here the general solution becomes this uh, that is sigma 1 squared minus mu 1 plus mu 1 squared 
mu1, mu1 minus 1, mu1 to the power of n, and mu1 n minus 1. So this is the general solution. So, uh, after all, uh, sigma n squared, that is the variance of the population size, is un plus mu1 to the power of n minus u1 to the power of 2n. So, substitute this, and uh, after some calculation, we have sigma1 squared mu1 to the power of n minus 1. 1 n minus 1 over uh, mu 1 minus 1. So that's the variance for the case where mu 1 is not equal to 1. Okay, next we consider the case where mu 1 is equal to 1. So mu 1 is equal to 1. In this case, the original uh, recurrence equation, a uh, difference equation becomes n this n one un minus u n minus one is equal to sigma one squared, but this is just a just an arithmetic progression, so the so it's easy to find the general solution for this that is uh, n times sigma one squared plus some constant, and this constant can be determined from uh, uh, from n equal to 1. So u1 should be sigma1 squared. And so therefore a is just 0. And in general, we just have sigma n squared equals to uh, gn double prime of 1 is equal to n sigma 1 squared. So it's just n times the variance of the first generation. So that's very easy. Let's summarize the results so far. So we have for the average population size this relationship. So so the on average the population grows or shrinks exponentially. So if mu1 is greater than 1, then the population will grow exponentially. And if mu1 is less than 1, it will shrink. And eventually it will go extinct. And for the variance, uh, it should be sigma n squared. Uh, for the variance, uh, we have uh, two different scenario. If mu1 is not equal to 1, if, so that means the average number of offspring is not equal to 1, not exactly equal to 1, then the variance grows or shrinks exponentially, like this, uh, like this one. And if mu1 is exactly equal to 1, then the variance only grows linearly. Next, we want to uh, calculate the probability of extinction, which means the population size becomes exactly zero. And this can be this probability of extinction can be calculated as the value of the probability generating function at s equal to zero. Okay, this is because by definition, uh, so this is this. Uh, j from uh, 0 to infinity and, and the probability uh, how, how should I write uh, okay, probability of x n equal to j e, s to the power of j is like this uh, from 0 and PR one S and PR X and two 
s squared and so on so if we put s equal to 0 then every term will disappear except for the first one so s to the power of 0 is 1 so only this part remains so uh, when s is equal to 0 it is equal to the probability of extinction okay so that's what we want to calculate mm, so to do that let's uh, define gn as the value of the generating function at 0 okay and first of all uh, g1 of s is uh, of course this and we know the probability gener uh, uh, mass function for uh, the first generation this is given so uh, lowercase g1 is uh, g1 of 0 that is p0 Okay, so this value is known. And from a previous result, we know that uh, gn of s is equal to g of gn minus 1 of s. So therefore, uh, g lowercase gn is equal to this g of gn minus 1 of 0, that is g of g lowercase gn minus 1. So hopefully by exploiting the properties of this function g, we may be able to find these probabilities of extinction. So let's study those properties. So first of all, uh, we limit uh, the range of s to be in this uh, interval from 0 to 1. And of course, uh, pj's are always between 0 and 1 because you know it is a probability. So first property is that g of 1 is 1. So this is this comes from the normalization of probability mass function. And second uh, property 1 is that g of s is always positive as long as p0 is positive. So because you know s is always non-negative so and probability is always non-negative so adding to 0 p0 any positive numbers results in a positive number so this makes sense and also if you differentiate this function g then it is again non-negative so because you know the result of differentiation is this so everything is positive here so it must be positive or at least non negative this means this function g is an increasing function and uh, if we differentiate again to obtain that second derivative then it is again a non negative function so this means this function is a convex function so together uh, the, this uh, property 0 means if you draw a graph of this uh, function on s with uh, s as the horizontal axis and g of s a, as the vertical axis it passes through this point 1 1 right 1 1 and it is non-decreasing so it's, it's like increasing function and it's convex function Okay. So convex means like this, not like this. Okay. So more generally, a convex function means that uh, the functional value is always greater than or equal to the tangent line at any point. Okay. So let's say if you draw a tangent line at this point, at this point, say. So tangent line is like this and the points on the curve g of s is always above this tangent line. 
So this happens for any point as long as the function is convex. Okay, so in general, uh, you should prove this property. If a function f is convex, then we have the following property. If y is greater than x, then f of y minus f of x divided by y minus x is greater than or equal to f prime of x. So this is a general property of a convex function, which we will exploit later. So as we have uh, explained before, gn of s is g of gn minus 1 of s. So in particular, we have lowercase g2, which is g2 of 0, is g of uh, g1. Okay. But this is, by definition, uh, this summation j from 0 to infinity, pj, and g1 to the power of j, which is, of course, greater than p0, because p0 is, is actually one of the terms on, on this, in, in this summation. So, but p0 is actually g1 itself. So in particular, we have this. G2 is greater than G1. Okay, so this is one fact. Then, we know that this function G is convex. So therefore, we have in particular this. G of Gn minus G of Gn minus 1 and Gn minus Gn minus one is you know this is equal to uh, gn plus one minus gn over gn minus gn minus one which is greater than uh, the derivative of g evaluated at uh, gn minus 1, but uh, this derivative is always non-negative. Okay. So, as long as if gn, so this denominator is positive, if this is the case, then uh, gn plus 1 is also greater than gn. Right? So this means, uh, and we do know g2 is indeed greater than g1. So if we continue this uh, logic, uh, this uh, inference for g3 and g4 and so on, we see that this sequence of gn's, this is an increasing sequence, or at least non-decreasing. Uh, is it non-decreasing? Decreasing. Uh, increasing. It's increasing. And also, this is bounded because this is a probability, so it is always less than or equal to 1. So from calculus, you should know that increasing, bounded increasing sequence always converges. Right, so there is, there exists this limit. Limit n approaches infinity, gn converges to some value. Okay, and since we have gn uh, equals to g and gn minus 1, so if we move n to infinity, we should have this limit should satisfy this functional equation. So lowercase g is equal to uppercase g of 
lowercase g. So by solving this equation for g, uh, we can calculate the probability of eventual extinction. Okay, uh, we are not uh, able to calculate this uh, probability of extinction for each n, but uh, we can we may be able to calculate uh, the probability of eventual extinction. So that is when n is sufficiently large, then this will be the probability of extinction. There is a very simple algorithm for solving this equation numerically. That is just uh, give some initial guess of this g and substitute this into this function g, uh, uppercase g. Then define this as the next value, the next estimate of g. Then we use this value to determine the next value. And we continue this process over and over until this converges. So in other words, we are trying to find a fixed point of this function g. So fixed point means if we uh, plug in this solution, then this function returns the same value as its argument. So in this case, we say g is a fixed point. Fixed point of this function g. Graphically, uh, we can interpret this process as the following. So if we plot this function g, uh, it looks like this, as we have explained. So it passes through this function uh, point 1, 1. So this is 1 and this is 1. So draw a line connecting uh, the origin and the point 1, 1. Uh, so this is, this line is, so if we take this x-axis and y-axis, so we have two, uh, one curve, uh, g of x and y equals to x. So this is, the second one is the, this straight line here. Uh, this straight line, this one. So what we are trying to do is to find the point where this line and the curve crosses. So there are at least two points, this one and this one. Okay, but we are actually trying to find this one. So first, suppose we have G0 somewhere here, uh, G0. Then we substitute this, in, uh, we put this value into this function uppercase G then using this function, we find, uh, we draw a horizontal line to find the next value. So at this point, this point is, uh, so this uh, y coordinate is g1. So this will be g1, g1. Okay. Then we substitute this g1 into this function again. That will be. Uh, so that will give you the value of g2. Then we draw the horizontal line again. So this uh, point will be g2, g2. Then we put this value into this uh, curve again. And we continue this until we reach this uh, crossing point. There, uh, we have found this uh, fixed point. After this point, it uh, this process uh, doesn't move any points. Okay, what if we start from here, somewhere here? Then we will have this value first. Then draw the horizontal line. The next value will be this. Next value will be this. So either way, we will reach this fixed point here. So that's what we are doing to find the fixed point, and this will give us the probability of extinction, uh, eventual extinction. Next, let us introduce the notion of martingales. 
So to do that, consider the following conditional expectation. That is the expectation value of x n plus 1. That is the uh, population size of the generation n plus 1, given the past history. So x0, x1, x2, and so on, up to xn. Of course, in the case of uh, the branching process we are considering, this is a Markov process, so it doesn't really depend on this history except for the very last step, this one. But anyway, let, let us consider this. So this would be uh, by a straightforward argument, it will be equal to xn times mu1 because each of the individuals in the nth generation uh, we expect mu1 offsprings so uh, after all the expectation value the conditional expectation value given there are xn individuals here then we expect this number of uh, individuals in the generation n plus 1. Okay, now let's define a new random variable zn by this xn divided by mu n. So we divide the number of individuals by the expected number of individuals in the nth generation. So in this case we know that mu n is equal to mu 1 to the power of n. Okay, so let's substitute this into the previous equation. Then we have uh, zn times mu 1 to the power of n plus 1 given all the history uh, and zn times mu 1 to the power of n plus 1 because we have extra mu 1 here. So this mu 1 to the power of x uh, n plus 1 cancels out. Oh. Cancels out so we have after all zn uh, plus 1 is here and xn equals to zn. Okay, so this means the conditional, uh, so if we consider the sequence of random variables, z1, z2, and so on, zn, zn plus 1, and so on. So if we consider the sequence of random variables, uh, the, the expectation, conditional expectation value of uh, this zn plus 1 is the same as zn. So in a sense, so the, the, uh, the random variable doesn't change, in a sense. So if this holds, then we say this sequence is a martingale. So that's martingale. This name comes from a strategy in gambling. Uh, so consider uh, some gam gambling like coin toss. So first a gambler bets one dollar. Then next in the next game, you know whether he wins or not, he bets two dollars. And in the next game, whether he wins or not, he bets four dollars. So. He, every time he plays a bet he doubles his stake his bet so this is called a uh, martingale strategy so here is a graphical representation of the martingale strategy in the first bet the gambler bets one dollar if he wins then his stake becomes two dollars and then in the next bet, he bets two dollars. If he wins, that will be four dollars. If he loses, 
he's broke. Uh, not broke, but uh, and, and he he's got zero zero dollars. And in the first game, if he loses, he's got zero dollars. Then he bets, you know, in spite of being broke, he bets two dollars. For example, by borrowing money or something. If he wins, then he wins two dollars because he bets two dollars, right? So if he loses, then he is now uh, has negative two dollars, but m m this means he is in debt. But in the next game, he bets four dollars, so that means if he wins, now he has two dollars, right? And if he loses, that becomes negative six dollars. So his debt increases. But anyway, this is uh, the Martin Gale strategy, and actually this is known as a sure way to win. Okay, it sounds strange, but uh, the expectation value of uh, the stake at any point is positive. To see this, consider he wins uh, for the first time in the nth game. Okay, so this means he lost the first game, and he lost the second game, he lost the third game, until nth game. Okay, so that means uh, in the first game he lost one dollar, in the second game he lost two dollars, in the third game, he lost four dollars, and he keep kept losing until n minus one game. So that will be two to the power of n minus one, and that is equal to two n two uh, two to the power of n minus one dollars. So now he has this much debt. But in the next game, he bets two to the power of n dollars and if he wins then he gets this amount of money and that will uh, with this money he can uh, pay the debt and still have one dollar left right so this minus this debt is equal to one dollar so if he gets out now he uh, go home with one dollar extra. So, in a sense, this is a sure way to win. But of course, you you know, it, it requires lots of money, and you may end up in debt for a long time. So, it's not recommended for obvious reasons. But anyway, this is the Martingale strategy. Now, let us examine if uh, this strategy is actually forming the Martingale in the mathematical sense. So we set random variables z0, uh, z1, z2, z3, and so on as the amount of bet. Okay, So z0 is a random variable that can take the value 1 only. So this is only one value is possible. And z1 is a random variable that can take two values, 2 or 0. So those are the possible values of the bet in the second game. And z2 can take, uh, it's, it's a random variable that can take the values 4, 0, 2, and negative 2. And, and in a similar manner, z3 is a random variable that can take values uh, 8, 0, 4, negative 4, 6, negative 2, 2, negative 6, and so on. Okay, so let's uh, write it down. So Z1, Z0 is a random variable that can take only 1. And Z1 is a random variable that can take 0 or 2. Z2 can take a negative 2, 0, 2, 4. And Z3 uh, 
can take negative 6, negative 4, negative 2, 0, 4, 6, 8. Uh, so as you can see, uh, these are, uh, okay, uh, uh, this can vary from neg some negative values to some large positive values, and in general, uh, we can write this set as this, Zn uh, varies from negative 2 to the power of n plus 2 and negative 2 to the power of n plus 4 up to uh, to the power of n minus 2 and 2 to the power of n. So in case of Z3, this the largest value is 2 to the power of 3. In the case of Z2, the largest value is 2 to the power of 2. And in case of 0, that's 1, 2 to the power of 0. Okay. And more generally, we can express this same thing as this. So it's of the form negative 2 uh, to the power of n plus 2m plus 2, where m is 0, 1, 2, up to 2 to the power of n minus 1. Okay, you should check that uh, uh, for these values of m, uh, we can recover this set of numbers, this set of numbers. Okay. And any of these values okay, appear only once in this set, of course, uh, as you can see in this. Okay, so no two numbers are the same. Uh, if you can see, uh, you can also check in here. Okay. So in each column here, every value is different from other values. So uh, we can assume that each appear with the same probability. Okay, and that will be uh, 1 over 2 to the power of n. So each of these numbers, so there are this many numbers, right? So 0 to 2 to the power of n minus 1. So there are 2 to the power of n numbers here. So each of them appears with the same probabil probability, so that will be this. Now we can calculate uh, the expectation value, unconditional one, of Zn. So that will be m from 0 to 2 to the power of n minus 1. And the probability of each number is this. And the value of each uh, possible uh, value of this uh, random variable is to this. And if you calculate this, this will be equal to 1. So that's uh, what we have seen in a previous example. No. Next, let us see some examples of the conditional expectation. Say Zn to uh, Z2 given Z0 and Z1. So we should uh, enumerate all the possibilities of this history. Okay, so, so if you look at this diagram, uh, Z0 and Z1, there are two paths, paths, okay, this and this. So the first one, uh, let's pick this one. So Z0 is 1 and Z1 is 2. So given that, uh, the expectation is uh, calculated as this. So Z0 is 1 and Z1 is 2. So in this case, there are two possibilities, 4 and 0. Okay, two possibilities for Z2. Okay, 
So this expectation is 4. So Z2 can take the value of 4 uh, with the probability uh, 1 half. Okay. So this can happen with 1 half, uh, probability 1 half and probability 1 half. Or uh, 0 times 1 half. So that is 2. And the other possibility is Z0, Z1 is equal to 1 and 0. Okay, so that is 1 and 0. And each of these, uh, okay, and for this, the possible values for Z2 is Z2 are, are 2 and negative 2. Okay, so 2, and uh, that happens with probability 1 half, and negative 2, which happens with probability 1 half. And the result is 0. And these two are the only possibilities for uh, Z2. So uh, the possible values so of this expectation conditional expectation uh, is given as this 2 and 0 so 0 and 2 okay remember conditional expectation is a random variable okay so therefore this this set means the possible values of this random variable which is an expect conditional expectation value and similarly, we can uh, compute the conditional prob uh, expectation of Z3, given Z0, Z1, and Z2. So applying the same technique, uh, you should have 4, 2, 0, and negative 2. And okay, in, in either case, okay, so for example, in the case of this one, conditional expectation of Z2, this set is actually the same as Z1. Okay, so that's 2 and 0. Okay, so this is actually equals to Z1. And in the case of Z3, this is actually equal to Z2, as you can see here. 4, 0, 2, negative 2. 4, 0, 2, negative 2. So, uh, in general, we can show for this system of gambling this expectation, conditional expectation. Zn plus 1 given Z0 up to Zn is actually the same as Zn. Therefore, uh, this sequence of random variables, uh, the amount of bet, at, is a martingale. Now let's try to prove the martingale, pro martingale property uh, for this system in general. So if you look at each step, uh, Let's say this step, uh, the gambler can win or lose with equal probability. And, and at, at each step, let's say uh, uh, nth step, the bet, the next bet size will be 2 to the power of n. Okay, so in this case, n is 1, so the bet size will be 2. And if he wins, then uh, his stake will increase to 4. And if he loses, uh, his stake will uh, decrease uh, by this amount. So let's formulate this in general. The expectation value of Zn plus 1 given any sequence of z up to uh, zn 
actually it only depends on the last step on the on this step so with probability one half he can win and the stake will increase by this amount right so currently he has this much stake uh, money and he bets this much amount of money and if he wins his stake will be the sum of these or he can lose with the same probability and at that point his stake will decrease by uh, this amount okay so actually this is a markov process because uh, property uh, because uh, you know this expectation value does not depend on any of these but only the last step so after all uh, this is equal to Zn so therefore this sequence of random variables Zn is a martingale and let's see a few more examples of martingales so consider a symmetric random walk where uh, so this is the a random variable and with uh, probability one half it can increase to uh, uh, increase by one so xn may be xn plus one or with the same probability xn plus one can be xn minus one so in this case so this is uh, the same uh, random walk as we have seen in the in a previous chapter where we dealt with uh, gambler's ruin problem. So in this case, this uh, sequence of random variables is a martingale. So we can show uh, this. This is of course a Markov process, and we can show that this is equal to one half and times xn plus one or uh, xn minus one so the result is xn therefore it's a mounting gear next consider the same random walk problem but we define a new random variable by uh, yn equals to xn squared minus n. Then this is a martingale with respect to xn. So that means expectation, conditional expectation of yn given uh, yn plus 1 given uh, xn is a martingale. So that is this. Okay, let's show this. So this one, the left hand side is uh, uh, by definition is this so the ex the conditional expectation will be uh, one half and xn will be increased by one with uh, this probability so the value of yn plus one would be xn uh, let's see xn plus 1 squared minus n plus 1 or with the same probability it will be xn minus 1 squared minus n plus 1 so if you expand this uh, we have uh, x n squared plus 2xn and one of one from here will be cancelled by one from here so it will be minus n and the next term is uh, and minus n 
so this will be cancelled by this and we have the same thing here and here but multiplied by one half so we have in the end x squared minus n which is y n therefore we have a martingale here we will be using this result in a, a later example and that is the problem of stopping rule. So in general, let's consider a sequence of random variables, uh, xr, where r is 0, 1, 2, and so on. So we want to stop this process once uh, certain condition conditions are met. For example, uh, we want to stop at the specific time, that is some given time t, we just stop. And in that case, we want to calculate, for example, the expectation value of this random variable x at time t. And second, we want to stop if the value of xr becomes greater than or equal to a certain uh, threshold. Okay, stop if some condition is met, uh, this condition is met. So this is uh, the problem of first passage time. So what we want to know is the expectation value of this time t. Okay. So th this time t is uh, is the time where uh, this condition is met. So maybe I should write this as t. Okay, for the first time, x crosses uh, this value. So what is this time on average? So that is uh, the value of interest. Regarding this problem of stopping, uh, stopping time, we have the following theorem, which we do not prove. Okay, let's call this uh, stopping theorem. Let's say uh, we have a sequence of random variables, which is a mounting gear. with respect to uh, another sequence of random variables. Okay, so this means uh, the expectation value of Zn plus 1 uh, given uh, x0, x1, and so on up to xn is equal to Zn. Okay, and let t be uh, the stopping time. Stopping time. And also, we impose the following three conditions. One, uh, the probability that t is finite is one. So, almost surely, the stopping time is finite. And two, the expectation value of the modulus of z t is finite and three expect uh, expectation value conditional expectation value uh, that uh, of z n given t is greater than n a certain number times probability that t is greater than n converges to 0 as uh, n goes to infinity. Okay, then uh, we have unconditional expectation of z t is equal to unconditional expectation of z 0. So uh, this is the theorem. 
As an application of this stopping theorem, we consider this symmetric random walk problem again. But uh, we impose uh, the initial condition that uh, x0 is equal to k and the stopping condition. So this process stops if xt uh, is either 0 or uh, a. So this is actually the stopping condition for the gambler's ruin problem. That is, either the gambler gets ruined or his opponent gets ruined. Okay. So, so what is the expectation value of this uh, stopping time? So, so since we uh, give the condition for stopping, uh, the quantity of interest is the expectation value of this stopping time. So from a previous example, we know that uh, this quantity yn, uh, x, which is defined as x n squared minus n, is a martingale with respect to x n. Okay, so by the stopping theorem, uh, we have the expectation value of y t. Okay, this is the expectation of uh, of y at time t, this should be equal to the expectation value of y zero. And by definition, this is x zero squared minus zero. Uh, but x zero is k, so we have expectation value of k squared, but k is just a constant, so it's k squared. On the other hand, uh, we can calculate this quantity in a different way based on the definition. So that is xt squared minus t, and that is xt squared minus expectation value of t. So, okay, this expectation is what we are, what we are interested in. Okay, uh, the first term is given by. So, since at time t the value of x is either zero or a. Okay, so this would be zero times the probability that xt is equal to 0 plus a squared times probability that xt is equal to a and minus expectation value of t and from the gambler's ruin problem we know that uh, this probability is uh, k over a okay and this is of course zero. So uh, from the previous calculation, this the left hand side should be equal to k squared. Therefore, uh, expectation value of the stopping time is uh, let's see uh, that's a k and a k minus k squared. So this is it. And actually, this is a uh, uh, result we have you know, got in the gambler's ring problem.